Father, we thank you. Um, again, just to come and we, we do this every week and, it, and it's a great opportunity for us to get into your word and understand ultimately who you are and uh, how that affects our lives and how we get to live and in my own heart to feel how, how blessed we are to be called by you to know you and that uh, by your grace we are saved and uh, we're seeing that more and more as we establish some of the foundations here in this study. Uh, you've told us to, to make our calling and election sure, and that's a great thing. And so we're, we're trying to do that in, in obedience to you. And so we ask for your blessings today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So um, one of the things that certainly we've been going through, this is our fifth class on uh, just kind of establishing some of the, the foundations of what we're doing. And what we've seen, the first one was kind of did an intro, and the second class we talked about God's sovereignty and all the verses, and then the third class we talked about free will, and what it means, and what it doesn't mean, and, and what it means on uh, kind of in the two camps that we've seen, the Arminian side and the Calvinist side, and, and then we've, we've tried to address it um, mostly just by looking at scripture, and um, we've talked about the philosophical backgrounds of everything, and that's going to be really important today because, um, remember... Uh, we use this term, or at least philosophers and even theologians, libertarian free will. What 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 was distinctive about that? Help me out here. Refresh me. Libertarian free will. What 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 does it mean? But did they have? Did, they progressed up a little bit so you could make make the choice of uh, free will. Meaning, I keep going. Yeah, Try to catch the bottom. I'm just remembering some of the things here. You know, in philosophy, libertarian free will is this idea that synergy. Well, we make choices that are non-influenced or not decisively influenced in one direction or another, and so. Um, in, in this idea, God has, re, remember we talked about, God has limited his own sovereignty. They, it's not that they deny God's sovereign, but God has, God will not, he's such a gentleman, and it's part of his plan that he will not intrude on your free will. Is, is that when we were talking about that the nothing, when you gave the example of being hungry as being an influencer for whether you make a choice or not, um, I just see as... Libertarians, like there's no influencers ever pressing there's, on your will. There's, this is where the choice takes place, but there's nothing decisively influencing that choice. That choice is completely equal between, I guess, it, well, in their mind, is good or evil, as an example, or between multiple choices of different things. Okay, so what we what we discussed in the sense of this libertarian is Does they they, have limitations though. For, well, it depends. See, we want to make sure we clarify things that are that are accurate. Um, some people, uh, like I mentioned, the quotes. Well, maybe it's in here. We'll get to it. Um, yeah, we'll get to it. Uh, Clark Pinnock is a. He started out as kind of a run-of-the-mill Arminian theologian, and but he he came to embrace libertarian free will in its most intense form, so that for him. The idea that God looks down and sees uh, Joe making a decision in the year 2017, because God sees it, that means that it's locked in, right? God, because God's knowledge is solid. Well, that can't be true according to this, because a libertarian has to always be free to make a contrary decision. So if God sees something then that means the libertarian free will isn't true because it's locked in. Now, we're getting into this. I don't want to get too much into this. So for him, what he decided to do, because he libertarian free will for him is so paramount, he said, well, God doesn't know the future. So God can't know the future now. So he, he changed his theology, and he got rid of God's omniscience in order to keep this as the supreme, which is really odd. So... Um, he kind of morphed, and so you have, um, that's, Pinnock. that's Pinnock, and what you have is um, now this view called open theism, or process theology, where the future is open. God knows the present and the past very thorough, uh, exhaustively. The future, though, God's always looking down, and he's, he's reacting, 
He's responding. He's growing in his knowledge. He's in process of changing. So what we, what we said was libertarian free will, it, it fails. What did we say? Reality, right? Because <laughs> we all have influences. Secondly, it fails scripturally. So just to, just to give that as a backdrop, it doesn't really correspond to what we experience in that we all have influences. We all have things that happen here that affect our choices, nurture, nature, you know, whatever, experience life. Purpose. God's purpose. Yes. But, so what, remember what we did is, is this, again, this libertarian idea is that God cannot and will not decisively influence. But yeah, we remember how we read all these scriptures just about... Um, for example, Psalm 105, 25 says, says that God caused the Egyptians to hate his people. And then later God gives them favor in the eyes of the Egyptians so that they plundered them. Right. So God is actively moving and creating, working here in order to get the choice. Okay? Do we need more chairs? There are more chairs in, in the back. We could take the coat off of this one. Yeah. Right after that. Is. Is that it? So... Yeah, thank you. They're just right in there to the right. You'll see them. Uh, so, what we're going to see... Go ahead, do you have something, Mike? I'm just stumped on this. What are you stumped on? Well, God's desire in the rebel house. Uh, laying, laying out things to give men the free choice, showing them those choices. God caused the Egyptians to hate them. That's what it says, right? Right. So that's what, what we're doing is we're trying to interact not so much with philosophy, because if you look at human philosophy, it's a bankrupt system. It contradicts itself. They're doing the best they can. But we want to stay with revelation, which is God's scripture, God's self-revelation. So I only bring that up to say we've talked about last week um, Jesus and his view on human depravity and free will. So what we're talking about still is that how does depravity affect the desires and then by definition, how does it produce acts or choices that we make? Choices we make that are producing acts. So, right here, first page. We're going to go through these really quick because I have a lot that I want to get to. Um, Genesis 6, 5. The Lord, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So, this being the case, that's a pretty clear passage. Remember we said that desire includes thoughts, um, motives, um, des well, desires or wants. Okay, How does that verse describe this? That they were only what? Evil. Evil. How often? All, all the time. All the day. That's literally what it says is all the day. Kol um, hayom in Hebrew. So, now, if this is the case of just starting here in Genesis 6, what's it going to produce? Bad choices. Bad choices. Bad, evil choices. Now, so, let's talk about this for a minute. So, right here at the beginning, we saw what Jesus discussed, depravity, last week. Okay, so that's last week. But... We wanted, I wanted to get a little broader perspective. Even Jesus obviously is, believes Genesis 6. Mankind is thinking evil constantly. Therefore, they're constantly, all the time, making evil choices. Right? Desire. Right? And rooted from desires. So, God isn't making fresh evil over here. Why do people sin? Because they want to. Let's, let's be, I mean, God isn't creating fresh evil over here to cause things. And next week, we're going to talk about hardening Pharaoh and other places. God causing the Egyptians to hate his people, Psalm 105. We're going to talk about how all that works. But for now, let's just wrestle with what the text says. So now, um, I don't have it on here, but who wants to read? Jan, will you read something? Uh, read 1 Corinthians 10, 31, and you read John 3, 20 and 21. Because 10, 31. And then... I'll just put over here, we all know this, um, or actually we'll do both of these. Romans 3.23, right? All have sinned and fall short of what? The glory of God. The glory of God. 
So this is important phrase. If you want to do just do a fun study, take a couple months. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just, just study the glory of God in all of its theological context. It's it's pretty awesome because um, if if I go as an unbeliever, helps you know a, a senior citizen cross the street. That's a good deed, right? Okay. God says all of our th all of our choices are evil. Somehow, that's what we're trying to recognize. So, 1 Corinthians 10.31, what does it say? So, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Okay. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And then John 3, 20 and 21, go ahead and read it. It's, it doesn't use that phrase, but he's talking about men love darkness rather than light. Go ahead. 3.20. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, mm -hmm. lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. That's This is the other carried out in God. So as an unbeliever, I might help somebody cross the street or I might sacrifice myself. But is it done in God and for the glory of God? No. no. Therefore, by definition, according to God's standard, it's a feel good. It, there's some other motive, right? Their intent. The intent, the motives, the intents, the thoughts. And we'll put that over here. So, th this is just super important as we start here that it is true that helping the person cross the street is a good thing. But in God's ultimate standard, it doesn't qualify as righteous. Therefore, he can call it less than this. Anything less than this good is considered evil. Now, it might be a better evil than me murdering the person crossing the street. Follow? Yeah. So, but just remember that this is super, super important as we think about Scripture telling us that all have sinned, etc. So, all the thoughts of the heart, evil. Genesis 8, we go... The intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. The intent, right here. Intent, by definition, leads to actions. Okay? So, um, Psalm 51, guilty of sin from birth, a sinner. Okay? The moment my mother conceived me. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7.20, none righteous. There's not a righteous man on earth who does good and who never sins. Uh, Ecclesiastes 9, full of evil. And insanity is their hearts throughout their lives. Uh, we know Jeremiah 17 as well. Uh, or 1 Kings 8, there's not a man who does not sin. The heart is incurably wicked. I'm going really quick. Okay. But Romans 3, 10 there. There is no one righteous. Just as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks God. All have turned away. Together they have become worthless. There is none... There is no one who shows kindness, not even one. What about me helping the person cross the street? Isn't that a kindness? For self. Pardon? For self. Maybe. See, again, how, who are you to judge my heart? Maybe I, you know, right? <laughs> <laughs> All you're saying is read the Bible, Mondo. <laughs> Romans 3.10. Okay. What? We can get all stuck up here and all this, and we can go crazy, but if we read the Bible... And we take it as scriptural truth. There's no one that does kindness. Somehow, it all, and this is Romans 3, 10 and 11. Later, he says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then, you know, the wages of sin is death. It's, it's okay. The key is, even my kindness is not done for the glory of God. Therefore, it doesn't count. So, Theologians, John Calvin, all these guys, this, it doesn't matter. They'll say, well, yeah, there's a civic goodness on this horizontal level. I can be good here, and unbelievers still can be kind to their kids. And on this horizontal level, they're good. But are they good on God's standard? The answer is no. Okay, question? I'm just saying this is the confusion with Christians today. Because uh, carrying our example, being good, kind, yeah. being patient, and... In fact, our free will is defined as for the glory of God, all right, and the movement of his gospel. But in fact, the world, and I know men out there who do greater things than I, for kindness, love, generosity, all that.
but not for the glory of God. And this is a real conundrum out there when they see us and we see them. That's why these two passages right here in John 3.21 are really done in God. This is this is beautiful. It, it, we got two witnesses here in Scripture, right? Let every truth be established by two or three. We're not just pulling a verse out of context. You can read it. Um, this is what helps us to understand also what Paul is saying is that even he says here, um, there's no one who seeks God, um, no one who shows kindness, not even one. Their throats are open graves. They just see poison. I mean, it just makes you feel bad here after reading this. But remember, this is talking about the unbeliever. Not talking about believers. This is talking about mankind in its in, in their natural state. Therefore, when we we'll talk about what happens when we become believers. Okay. What Mike was just relating about. Uh, I know a lot of people uh, that, that uh, really do good things, but isn't isn't that where self righteousness comes it, in? Isn't that the, the we don't know. The, most of them are, will tell me and brag to me what they do. Exactly. And and when yeah. they're doing it, I want to. I want to correct them without, you know, uh, offending them, but they're really proud of their goodness. And this is the question. Did you do it for God's glory? And the answer generally is no. So what we got to be careful of, we recognize that somewhere in there, there it's evil all the day long. But we don't want to judge hearts. That's not our business. Okay. But nevertheless, we do have this theological truth. And we could just say, well, did you do it for God's glory, not your own? Your own boasting, right? We're going to get into boasting and what that looks like. The unbeliever likes to boast. And again, when we ask the question, um, you know, and I, I use this all the time in, in, in just evangelism, is, you know, Joe, if you died tonight and you stood before God and he said, why should I let you to heaven? What would you say? Most often, they start bringing out their resume. Well, I go to church. I helped the person cross the street. I did. They, and I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't bring your resume, man. That's bad. Let me just tell you. We want to bring Jesus' resume because it was all for the glory of God and it was perfect. And it gets right to the point of them trusting in their own resume. But we recognize, it's not on here. I probably should have had it. Isaiah 64, 6. All our righteousness is as what? Filthy rags. Filthy rags. So your resume is filthy rags. And what's the literal of it? You guys know that, right? What is it? Menstrual. Menstrual. And you look it up. It's menstrual cloths. Your righteousness is as good as menstrual stuff. Except for what Christ does through us and when our hearts don't condemn us, then we can know that, that we're in Christ if our hearts okay. don't condemn us. We're talking us. about unbelievers here. Okay. So you're right. We're not there yet. This is... Not about our righteousness that Christ does in us. This is talking about unbelievers who bring their own private resume and say, this is what I've been doing. Okay, so remember that. That's super, super important. Because I remember talking about this, well, for a long time, and, and some Christians would get offended because they'd go, well, all my good things that I'm doing? I said, well, no, that's, this isn't talking about you. Yours is for the glory of God, and that's good. And God is working at Jesus, and apart from me, you can do nothing. But that fruit that we have is good. It's genuine good. It's not a, a, a pseudo good because we're doing it for the glory of God. So that's a positive thing, and, and God is honored by it. Okay, let's keep going. <coughs> Ephesians 4, excluded from the life of God. What I, you can see what I'm doing. I'm just highlighting the, the bold points here. Titus 3 talks about us being enslaved. Now, that's super important. Okay, over here, we are enslaved. This is describing this situation. Notice what he describes. Uh, Disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts, pleasures, spending our life in malice, and being hateful, etc., etc. Okay, Romans 8, 5. We're not even, the flesh cannot please God. It's not able to do so. 1 Corinthians 2. He cannot understand Ephesians 2, we'll read that. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too, our past, all, all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh 
and the mind, right? And were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So, when you read this, let's flip it over, because we're going to keep moving here. Um, as we, this is, we have to get this. If we don't get this as a foundational, when we get to the next step, it's going to be confusing. What we recognize is that this description, we do have a will. Oftentimes, with, whether it's Calvinists or Armenians, mean, there's a lot of uh, mudslinging that goes around between the two groups. And uh, I was talking to a buddy of mine just yesterday because I said, hey, here's some notes I want you to take a look at. And he, um, he's been, he was the one that kind of introduced me to the topic. But for him, he, he, he's very, <laughs> he, he would say this, he's very anti-free will. And I go, hey, you got to be careful because you don't don't mischaracterize the reformers. The reformers believed that everybody has a free will. It's just Luther said our desires are what in bondage or enslaved, which we just read, right? If you're if you're a, if you're a doer of sin, Jesus says in John eight, you're a slave of sin, right? He came to give us freedom. We see um, slavery appear again, and also in Romans six. But the will, the acts, are free to do what the desires are. Okay? That's, so we, they're still free. The will is free to do the desires. Well, what are the desires? Well, what are the desires? Enslaved. You see that? Super, super important. So does mankind still have free will? Well, yes, but not in the libertarian sense. That we, the libertarian says... If I was to erase all this, they put over here neutral. All decisions are based on neutrality. Well, scripture doesn't say that at all. Reality doesn't say that. And that's why libertarian free will, as much as I might want to believe it, because it seems fair, scripture doesn't get me there. We recognize this is where the desires are, and it produces evil choices and actions. Scriptures, again, Jesus, all this is is a sampling, right? We don't have all day to do this. I th is it overwhelming? Okay, we should. We all agree. Okay, <laughs> I think it's pretty clear. So, <laughs> on this chart I gave you, I kind of just this is just kind of I don't want to necessarily go through all of it, except to show you the different viewpoints of what has happened. And um, let's see. Let's go down to the Arminian perspective, and we'll talk about the differences between the two camps to help us just understand the text. Um, again, to be fair, an Arminian, for original sin, believes total depravity and total inability. But I put on here hypothetical. The reason why is because what they do is, do they believe all these verses? Yes. Okay. If I had a different color, I would put a different color here. How they solve this, it's hypothetical because of prevenient grace. So what, oh, let me, sorry, prevenient grace. What prevenient grace does is it brings us back to a state of neutrality. Where God's grace, they, they give God credit, they're, it, God's grace removes the bondage of free will, of, of the desires that we've had, and now we're able because... What did we see last time? Jesus said, you can't. You cannot even choose because the, your desires are evil. Well, they said, oh, you know what? God gives grace, brings universally all of humanity back up to this state of neutrality so that we can then make a good choice, right, of Jesus, of faith, etc., that is rooted out of our free will. All right? What exactly is prevenient? Grace. We're going to get to it. Okay. Okay. The whole next page. But I say hypothetical because we'll, we'll talk about what they mean by that. But all of what we just read is just erased <laughs> by prevenient <laughs> grace. Use, That's convenient, right? They use, they use Romans 8, 29. In the sense of foreknowledge? Yeah. Um, not necessarily. We'll, we'll get to that. We're going to talk about foreknowledge next week. 
okay? But I want us to say, I, I don't want to impugn them to say that they don't believe all that. They'll say, oh yeah, we believe all that. We just, prevenient grace solves it. Boom, done. Easy, okay? So that's why I put hypothetical. Now, imputation of Adam's sin or guilt is usually denied. In Deuteronomy 24, 16, I put, you see that on there? It's because Deuteronomy 24, we see it in other passages, Ezekiel 18, where God says, a son will not be punished for his father's guilt. Right? That seems reasonable. Well, if my dad sins, I shouldn't get punished for it. And so, based off that, they describe that, yes, we know Adam sinned, and for us, what we just read, all of these desires and these wicked evil continually is resulted from our sin nature that we got from Adam. But in, in um, Arminian theology, okay, I'll just do this, they, you have the sin nature from Adam, but you also have the guilt. These are two different things. Uh, the sin nature, we know what that is, but the guilt brings death. So, one of the questions that they ask is, they'll say, well, um, yeah, we understand we inherited the sin nature, but we did not inherit the guilt. So let me ask you a question. Um, we saw this passage. The wages of sin is death. Okay. How is it? Very, very um, provocative question. How is it that babies die? Is a baby innocent? Yes. Yeah, no. 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 Cool. no it's a <laughs> If a baby's innocent, then the baby can't die. The wages of sin is death. Right? Let's just think about this. Somehow, somewhere, in some way, even babies are considered guilty because they die. Otherwise, God would have to rescue every last baby from dying because the payment for sin is death. Now, that doesn't, that's not saying that they have, through their sin nature, sinned. Okay? They haven't sinned. But what God does is he holds them guilty because they are descendant of Adam. Imputation. Imputation. Original Psalm sin? Psalm 51. Yeah, Original yeah. sin, yes, gives us two things. Psalm 51, which is on that list. Mm -hmm. Original sin is the doctrine that teaches that we've inherited a sin nature. It's not the first sin. Okay? We're not talking about it, Even though there was a first sin. Original sin says we've inherited a sin nature. Everybody agree you have one? Yeah. Okay, we all do. Yeah. Secondly, we've inherited guilt. Now, what I'm not saying, okay, is that all babies are going to hell. What I am saying is according to the scripture that the baby deserves to go there because of the guilt it received from its father Adam. But that doesn't mean the baby's going there. You follow? Gotcha. Okay. Really, really important. Because otherwise we go, whoa. What we do know is that if a baby dies, there's some sort of guilt there. And it's interesting that if you look at, I don't know if I think I put a quote. Um, no, I didn't put the quote on here. I'm sorry. Anyways. Can I give a physical example? Yes, please. All right, so I always go, how, how does the spiritual play itself out in the physical? Because uh -huh. I think that God gives us a lot of things to look at like that. And I think of um, some of my clients' mothers were using drugs when they were in the womb. Mm -hmm. They are sure. born addicted. Mm -hmm. No fault of their own. They have an addiction to that drug when they're born. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't choose it. They, it was chosen for them. It was the guilt mm -hmm. of the behavior of the parent that brought them into this world bearing that reality. Um, and so I, I, this just reminds me of that. We, when we're born into this world, we have that guilt. Yep. As a human being, it is just straight into us of nothing that we've even chosen, but we have to deal with it. It's a, it's a yep. reality we have to deal with. The ramifications yes. of it. Yes, absolutely. So uh, my... I. That's, I appreciate that because I actually think all babies that die go to heaven. And I think 2 Samuel 12 and other passages, that's just my view. I think they're all elect, okay, because of the inability for other reasons. But nevertheless, they don't deserve to go there because they've inherited the guilt from the original sin. But by God's grace, I think they all do for whatever his reasons are. That, But I don't want to get into that, okay? 
Pardon here? We're still talking about the natural man. This, correct. This is all original sin, natural. All right? This is the 1 Corinthians 2 that says the natural man cannot receive or understand the things of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14. We're still talking. We haven't got to Christians yet, okay? So on this chart, uh, just this is just extra credit, okay? Just read this on your own. Uh, because we don't have time because I, I want to get to some other things. But this kind of helps us that um, to see where each group kind of stands uh, in, and some examples of that. Now, on the second chart that I gave you on the bottom, free will affected from pre-fall to post-fall, I do want to talk about this because before the fall, we had the ability to not sin and the ability to sin. Okay? That was, the, that, was that, the two abilities. After Genesis 3, we lost that ability to not sin, and we became enslaved. Therefore, all of the desires of man are wicked continually all the day from our youth, okay? The intentions, all right? But the, and, um, the, we lost the ability to not sin, and we still have the ability to sin, which is why we're enslaved, okay? The Armenians claim that pervenious grace overcomes this fall, into inability, that yes, we fell, but because of the prevenient grace, now, well, neutrality, or we have the ability again to do good and to choose, which is the best good you could ever do is to choose Christ. Okay? So, ability regained. Well, voila, there it is, in one motion. We're going to talk about whether that's biblical or not in a moment. Just a quick question. Okay. Prevenient grace, they hang on to that, and do they use scripture to um, prove that? The next page, we're going to go there. Okay. Nothing in scripture. So, we're going we're gonna to talk about what their verses they use, okay. um, and how they, and we're going to assess whether we think that it's, it's effective, or whether it's effect, you know, uh, persuasive. Um. When we think about this provenient grace idea, their entire system depends on this. If, if this shows itself not to be as scripturally persuasive as you know, we want, then we go, your whole system fails. Because then we go back to the default of enslavement. Jesus said, no one can come to the Father unless what? My Father draws him or enables him or gives it to him. Therefore, it becomes part of the, the Father's choice and not man's choice. You can see right now, we'll, we'll talk about that at the end, about how they believe that we get there. So, however, after po uh, post-conversion here, the ability to not sin for a Christian is regained. We have a new nature. Now, it's extremely tough to put that into practice every single day. But what we do know is that now, according to um, what we see in scripture, I put some verses down there. Let's let's read those. Uh, who wants to read Jeremiah 32, 40? Jerry's got it. And then let's read Ezekiel 36, 25, and 27. Who, who has that one? Thank you. Okay. So as we think about this over here, and we'll leave that up for a second. I'm going to divide this now into two. This is the old man. And this is the new man, all right? Or the new nature. The old man, evil. How long? How often? All the day. All the day, all right? <laughs> okay, all the day. The new man, though, we have this new heart. Okay, who's got Jeremiah 32? Well, let's read Ezekiel 1 first. I like that one. Okay. Go ahead. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Okay, stone of heart, you know, stubborn, defiant, right? We're going to get a new heart that's malleable, that God works. We get the Holy Spirit, it's cleaned. Okay, what about Jeremiah 32? Let's, that, that one's good too. Jeremiah 32, 30? 40. 40. 40. Okay. 
Re roll out so the camera can hear you too. You don't mind. Okay. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them. And I will inspire them to fear me so that they will never turn away from me. How conclusive is that? How exhaustive is that? A lot of never. A lot of never superlatives, ways. right? Yeah. Pretty final. Who's the one doing the work here? God. God. See? God right here. There's something new that it's we call this regeneration or being or born again or the new birth, whatever, whatever if, you know, we have a lot of terms. God is the one that does this, and so now out of this new heart is good if God, it's also good. Therefore, what are our actions gonna be? So as an as a however, post conversion, so the ability to not sin is regained, but the ability to sin. Still sin is retained, but we are no longer enslaved. If the Son sets you free, what? Free. You're free indeed. So, if we sin now, you can't say, well, it's because I got my sin nature. Says, no, no, no. You have this new nature. You sin still because you want to, and you're giving in to these, now, fleshly things. What I, I want to clarify something. As a believer, we don't have two natures, all right? We are not a schizophrenic. We are not a schizophrenic. <laughs> but what we do know is that the new heart is still stuck into this flesh, this body of death, is what Romans 7.25 says. <laughs> body of death. So, we got this new nature. It desires goodness. It, it's, we're born again. It's, we're, we have the Holy Spirit. We're cleaned up. It desires righteousness. It desires good things. And the choices we make out of those desires would be good. It just happens to still be dwelling in this fleshly body. Right. Which at glorification, the fleshly body will be removed. Right? Yeah. It'll be put into a new body, according to 1 Corinthians 15, which is incorruptible. Yeah. Not uncorrupted. Incorruptible. The ability to sin at that moment is removed. What happens is the body catches up with new heart. At the moment of resurrection. Follow? That's so exciting. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Galatians 2.20. Yes. We're talking about the new man, old things pass away. But in, second, in Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ, no longer I who live. What dies and what lives? The old man dies. The new man's alive. 2 Corinthians 5.17, we're a new creature, right? All Behold, all things are new. The only thing remaining that's not new is this still body yet. That we put to death daily. Correct. We have to overcome the flesh. And that's the lifetime that we have. So let's. So what we have here is the difference between over here, we'll get rid of this, is that for the Arminian okay, and the Calvinist, there's two different perspectives here. In that, for an Arminian, they have faith, and that produces regeneration. Calvinist says, whoa, 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 you can't have faith, which is something that's a positive choice, because faith is expressing a will, a choice. You can't have faith without being regenerated. Regeneration precedes faith. This, this is a huge battle between these two guys. Okay? Amen. Faith is what causes me to be born again. And they'll say, well, we get there because the faith, remember, the faith that we have to choose is rooted not in, the, <laughs> we'll see this in a minute. So this is kind of taken away a little bit through prevenient grace. So the prevenient grace is what causes us to have the faith and then we get regenerated. But let's read, like we did last time, 1 John 5, 1. We'll make a good progress. Jerry, you got that? Sure. And let's read Proverbs 21 1 just for the sake of fun. Who's got that one? I'll do it. Thank you. First John 5 1. Yep. Listen to what it says here. Go ahead. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. What comes before belief? Action. Everybody who believes. What comes before that? Read it. Believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. What comes first over here? Born of God. Born of God which is the same thing as regeneration. But it's simultaneous. 
Well, agree. Because Belin is there too, and you could, in this version, is faith comes first. But I think it's simultaneous. What you because have he is. causes it, he instills it. That's the key, is all these things happen, you know, but there is an order to them. And, but this is a theological, you know, juggernaut here of this debate. Because if faith comes first, then who is first? Man. Man. Well, because God gives us Here's, the faith. Yeah, God, man, God is, it's, well, I'll say this. God and man. In the Arminian system. And we'll see what that, how that plays out in a moment. Okay. So, post-glorification, you can see there, we have new sinless bodies, the ability to not sin, and we're no longer able to sin because we're made like God, isn't it? That? And that'll be great in that day. Okay. Let's go to the next page. We will, we're going to make it. <laughs> Pardon? Bad theology or borderline heresy? Well, at least insufficient theology... Because it's making some assertions that lack biblical text. Um, I think that there are... What I don't want to do, honestly, as much as I might, you'll see, as much as I might disagree with it, uh, I don't want to read motive into that. I'm not saying you are. I don't want to read motive. They're trying to understand, and, and honestly, they're trying to, they're trying to recognize uh, free will. The goal of prevenient grace, and to their credit is they want to rescue God from any sort of negative connotation of being so evil that he would select people. Remember we talked about, what was, this, what was the word that we saw as really the, the hope that was, that was in the middle of all this? Equal. In provenient grace, God equally gives his grace to all people. God says, hey, don't call it on me. I've given my grace equally to everybody. Therefore, you cannot accuse me of being unfair, unrighteous, unjust, etc. But what we see, again, I don't, in Matthew 20, remember the parable of the vineyards? Yeah, right. They were upset that the owner gave his pay unequally. And they said, you have made them equal. So the argument in Matthew 20 is against grace, mercy, which, remember, does God owe anybody this? No. That's, that's important. He paid everyone. Pardon? And, and then there, he paid everyone what he agreed. And then also there's the parable of the soils, where the soils didn't respond to the seed being mm -hmm. spread abroad. So this, they didn't respond equally. They, so no, it puts agreed. the guilt on the soil. I well, don't know if I'm saying that right. Well, what, the, 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 the battle, we'll get to this, especially next week. We're going to come to <coughs> Romans 9. And we're going to talk about foreknowledge in Romans 9. And we're going to see, so we're going to let the, just the text speak. But we're going to get to it a little bit at the end today. Okay. So, prevenient grace just means preceding grace. Okay. It's this grace that precedes to all people, um, removing the effects of the bondage that the free will has been cursed with by Adam. And you go, oh, okay, that's a nice thought. Is there any scripture for it? Because that would be great if there was scripture. So what we want to do, let's, let's talk about this from, we'll just see what it does here. Um, first paragraph, uh, Provenient Grace, second line. Provenient Grace in Arminian theology has a wide range. It can be seen almost as anything of kindness that God gives to mankind. Food water, food, water, talents, virtues. But mostly it is a reference to how this grace restores man's freedom lost in the fall to choose God out of their own free will. This grace removes the inability to choose God on their own, which was inherited. Okay, we talked about that. Most Arminian scholars acknowledge that there is no explicit biblical evidence for prevenient grace. I mean, I was listening to a debate a couple weeks ago, and the guy goes, yeah, we, we acknowledge. This is one of the pro proponents. He said, yeah, we acknowledge there's no explicit text for this. But it has to be because of God's nature of being, and a better word, I thought, that's interesting that you start there. It's a presupposition. It is a presupposition. Driving the whole ship. And therefore, you start with this idea of fairness, and then you look for scripture to say, well, it's got to be there. 
Okay, so he goes on. I'm giving you a quote here. Uh, William Combs uh, well, writes concerning even Clark Pinnock, who wished to accept Prometheus grace in order to avoid Calvinism as a logical result of a soteriology that begins with total depravity, admits that he is forced to give up on the idea because, quote, the Bible has no developed doctrine of universal prevenient grace. That's really, really important that here you have this guy that really desperately wants it to be true. He had to give it up. But what, so if he gave it up, what did he embrace? This is the guy that embraced libertarian free will as the highest level of God's uh, gift to mankind. And then it ended up getting him over to open theism, unfortunately. So as we think about this, it's the logical result, and I think biblical, of a soteriology which begins with this total depravity of bondage. Both systems agree. Depraved. We saw that. Remember I gave you guys some quotes from Jacob Arminius, and we thought they were Calvinistic, and in fact they weren't, because he believed, and they believe in total depravity, but prevenient grace just erases it. So that's why it's kind of hypothetical. Okay, um, here's some quotes from a guy, Roger Olson, who wrote the book, again, Against Calvinism. Is it, is it clear where he's coming from? Okay. <laughs> just the title. Okay. If anyone comes to Christ with repentance and faith, it is only because they are enabled by God's provenient grace to do so. Anybody that comes to the good choice of faith and repentance is because of provenient grace. They're giving God credit there. So this provenient grace. The other thing that we'll see is Calvinists will say is the, all this also is grace. The difference between the Calvinist, okay, let me write it over here, all right? Just so that you guys can, can see this. Okay? A and C. Um, they call it provenient grace, which means it's universal, it's given to everyone. That's a big difference. And after they have received it, they can still reject God. They can still reject the gospel. All right? On the Calvinist side, they say, well, uh, this is just effectual grace, if you want to use that term. It's given to some, and ultimately, it will be effectual, and it will produce believers who, a lot of times, they talk about this being irresistible. Okay, in, the, in its finality. But we also know that what is often mischaracterized by the Calvinist side is our Arminian will give you all these verses like at, um, Luke 7.30 which says the Pharisees resisted God's purpose for them. They'll say, see, see, see? Man resists God all the time. Well, the Calvinist is insane. In fact, they're the ones that are saying more that they are resisting that they are completely depraved and resist constantly, evilly, continually, all the day. So this idea that uh, pulling a verse out of the Bible showing that men resist, they're going, so what? We already told you that. But this, what they're saying is that this grace is given to some, not all, and it will finally, it will always produce the result that God desires, which is salvation. And this goes back to John 6. Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come, and I will raise him up on the last day. Right? How many? All, All of who? Every, the whole earth? Just the given. And they will come over here, they will come, and they will be raised up. We talked about that last time. That is like solid. There's no chance, there's no, is there any hint of failure in this system? Yeah. The job is done because Jesus said, "Well, the, the, all, these, all that the Father has given me, I'm going to make sure that because of, I love my Father." Christ said, "It is finished. It's not partially finished. correct. It is finished." But prevenient grace is given to everyone equally. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna see more of this sumness. Don't get offended by that yet. Okay, you might next week, but we'll we'll see that in Romans nine. This, everyone, equally, man, that's fair. That's great. That just, okay, you know what? But even after they receive that grace, they can still reject the gospel and say, yeah, thanks God for that, but you know what? I'm going to do my own thing. And they end up unsaved. 
Okay? That's super important. Okay, so let's keep going here. Classical Arminian theology, I'm quoting Roger Olson here, attributes the sinner's ability to respond to the gospel with repentance and faith to provenient grace. Provenient grace is the illuminating, convicting, calling, enabling power of the Holy Spirit working on the sinner's soul and making them free to choose saving grace or reject it. So you see here, mm -hmm. it neutralizes this evil, makes it neutral. Now they're completely free to make the choice and whether they choose good or evil is now on them. It comes out of this neutral free will. All right. John Wesley, who was a Methodist preacher, he affirmed original sin, including total depravity, in the sense of spiritual helplessness. But he also affirmed God's universal gift of prevenient or enabling grace that restores freedom of the will. You see how we're getting into the free will debate? It always comes back to this. Luther said, bondage. He said, Arminius said, yes, but now free again through prevenient grace. All right? Arminianism has always insisted that the initiative in salvation is God's. Let's, let's be fair to them. They're not just saying it's all man. The initiative is God's. It is called prevenient grace, and it is enabling but resistible. They receive it, and they still can choose and walk away and say thanks, but no thanks. Now, this last one is really... I just You help me here. So, in Arminian theology, this is him quoting... A partial regeneration does precede conversion, but it is not a complete regeneration. It is an awakening and enabling, but not an irresistible force. Prevenious, prevenient grace is God's powerful attracting and persuading power that actually imparts free will to be saved or not. Well, the fact of the matter is, they're already unsaved. So giving them prevenient grace doesn't impart a power for them to be Saved or not, they're already in that condition because provenient grace doesn't save people. It just gives them the ability to make the choice whether to remain unsaved or to get saved. But secondly, I would have loved to have some verses here for this idea of a partial regeneration. Yeah. Not a complete re regeneration. Where in the world does that come from? Has he shown that in any other time? <laughs> no. Yeah. It's a, he's trying to use... This, he's recognizing the, the, the limits of prevenient grace. And so he's trying to give us like a half new man, a half of a new heart, a partial Holy Spirit cleanse. Because what we see is, as we saw here um, with the Ezekiel passage, God says, I will put my heart in them, or my spirit in them, and they will never walk away. They will never not follow my paths, Right? That's solid. That's not partial anything. That also is pretty guaranteed at the end. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, just a quick question to anybody. Do we have a parable that works the other side of the fence? Immediate, uh, immediate salvation. I, I, this may not Help me out here. Let's, uh, uh, this is all for us to yeah, discuss. I think of the, I think of the uh, Pharisee and the sinner on the corner. Okay. Okay. I think of the uh, I think of the Pharisee before he says that you know thank you Lord I'm not like this guy that he actually went through a thought process but also convinced of his own religiousness whereas the the sinner I see him on his knees going forgive me I'm a sinner sinner and hence getting a re regenerated heart right there there was no question in his mind. That, oh, you know, I like this, I'm doing this and stuff, but, uh, I mean, he jumped right okay. in. The question comes... Do we have a parable that speaks to this? If we did, they'd have it. And so let's go through no, the no, verses. No, not, not, for prevent, not for their grace, but for ours. In the sense of, well, well it, of a parable? You only want a parable? Well, no, we have scripture and stuff. I, I guess what I'm asking, did Jesus speak, speak directly? Whether in a parable, I, I don't. Or, I think what we saw, we saw Jesus speak directly last week. John six, John eight, John ten, John eighteen. Read into that when we look into you, beginning the work of me and being faithful to complete it. Or is that totally different? No, that's this is Philippians one six. You just described it, right? Okay, that's there you go. He who began the good work, right here. Let's put it over here then will complete it. And 
until the day of redemption. There's no risk. And so we haven't even got into the idea of, of perseverance, where the Arminian side says, oh, not only can someone get provenient grace and reject it and say, I want to stay unsaved, but they can become saved and then walk away and become unsaved again. To play the devil's ad advocate, that, um, we observe that a lot um, in in people that have the Christian lingo. Make profession, they, make they go to church for a long time mm -hmm. and then they fall away. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus, the the Bible says, on the other hand, they never belong to me. Um, uh, but I can see the that feeling really good mm -hmm. um, to um, put it back on. The people and to say, well, they they started this partial regeneration, yeah. but then they chose not to. to. So I can see that point, um, like for for the Armenian side, because we we see it a lot, and a lot of times we have a hard time going, well, because we want to know whether they were saved or not. Yeah. And so it's, I know I struggle with people that I've watched appear to walk with the Lord. Um, we and, all see that, right? Yeah, and they, they uh, read their Bibles, they come, and then I was like, well, it seemed like they got baptized and this and that, and now they're walking away. Um, but I have to also remember that I only see the small part in time, and that God is working. And so it's, a, it's an interesting thing, and I can see why people would like that yeah. viewpoint. Second and third soils, they hang in there a long time, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it, but they, they aren't producing any fruit. Mm -hmm. I think, too, that, you know, the, we, we'll get into that later in the sense of what that looks like. But, okay, so, uh, Paco, yes? Does, doesn't it give you the impression, it gives me the impression that if you already know the answer, you have to put in partial regeneration to arrive at that answer that you've already... The presupposition? Yeah. I think that's... You know, what I don't want to do is try to read motive into any of the Arminian in a negative way. Because again, there I do believe that what motivates a lot of this theology is to rescue God from being labeled as being unfair. Mm -hmm. We'll see that next week. So I want to give them credit there. The other one, you know, if, if we were to if try to impugn and say, well, what are the other motivations as well? That it, like, I, I really do think that their other motivations is not necessarily heresy or bad theology. But they want to make it, man, if, God, if, if a person ends up unsaved, it's the man's fault, not God's fault. And, and that seems very reasonable. Yeah. I mean, a part of me wants to embrace that. But that's our natural choice. It is natural. Well, I guess what I'm saying, there's, there's the salvation issue and there's the sanctification issue, right? So We're, we're only talking salvation right now. Only salvation, because it seems like the Philippians part is only talking about sanctification it starts with salvation, jumps into sanctification, and ends in glorification. The he who began a good work, that's salvation, calling, justification, into sanctification, he'll complete it all the way until glorification. We'll talk about that next week in Romans 8, 29 and 30. it's a package. Oh, exactly. And if you read the... Well, we'll get there. Okay, okay. Let's... let's we got 10 minutes here. Oh, man. All right. So... I, I've given you, you can read this, so maybe I won't spend all the time in, in, in what they're doing here. But in John 1, these are some verses that they say, well, maybe these are, maybe these, an Arminian will say, well, maybe these verses are showing provenient grace. Um, so this is John 1, 9. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. Well, hey, well, what is... No, okay, that's pretty, that's pretty amazing here. That how is man being enlightened? Maybe this enlightenment is provenient grace. Illumination. That isn't in my verse. What does yours say? Mine just says true light, it gives light to everyone who was coming into the world. Not... <coughs> You're reading NIV. Yeah. So the reason why I chose the NASB is the NIV is not a word for word. Mm -hmm. This NASB kind of gives us the flow of the Greek a little bit more literally versus an interpretation. I like the NIV, I'm not saying, but that's why for us to interpret, I wouldn't do, um, I would always consult a more literal translation than just the NIV, even though the NIV does a good job usually. Okay, so I've given you the, the general options of what this means. A, general revelation meaning 
Is this talking about that the, the general, is there a reference to general revelation that we see the world, the created order? Most likely, all scholars, even Armenians, say no. The second one is, well, this is inner illumination that leads to conversion given to all peoples, but it does not refer to every last human being without exception, to all, but to all people groups without distinction. That's important. That when Jesus comes into the world, he is bringing something of enlightenment to all peoples. Not every last individual. Because in reality, the problem is, even if we were to say this is provenient grace, what's the problem? Logically here, if Jesus is the one bringing provenient grace, what happened to all the Old Testament people? Yeah. Whoops! Yeah. And what you see is, I, I don't, I was trying to read and read and read and get some sort of, of Arminian understanding of how they overcome that because in reality, ever, if Jesus is the one bringing it through this illumination, as the text says, he came into the world and he brings this, all the Old Testament saints are out of luck. So therefore, provenient grace didn't exist at all in the Old Testament. And we know that people were saved. Okay, so that, so, But what I think here, I've given you all these verses because in John theology, it's really, really um, super important that John, who is writing his gospel much later... 90s AD or so, he is focused primarily on the fact that Jesus was, his, his message was to all peoples of the world, not to the Jews only. Now think about that. So, hey everybody, when Jesus comes, he's bringing light to all people. Not every last human being that existed, but all peoples, okay? And I've given you some verses here to show you the consistency of what I'm saying the next day he saw Jesus coming, John 1, 29. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the Jews, no, the world. of the world. Okay, for God so loved the world, John three sixteen. John is teaching. No, remember, John can pick a whole bunch of what Jesus has said. Right, he's selecting. He, and obviously it's not a verbatim of every last word that Jesus said. So he's picking things that Jesus said, truth incorporating them into his book in order to present a very consistent, unified theology. And I think one of his theological viewpoints is that Jesus was not the Savior of the Jews only, but of the whole world, which is consistent with Isaiah 49, 6 and other passages, being a light to the Gentiles. Notice, he talks about the woman at the well in John 4, 42. He says, he quotes, this. he could have quoted a lot of things, but he quotes here, the Samaritans saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Now the Samaritans were outsiders to the Jews. And they're going, oh, the woman at the well, thank you for telling us. We've talked to him and now we believe he's not the Savior of the Jews only, but also of Samaritans. You see that, how it's developing? Okay, Jesus said in John 10, 16, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear. They will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Here's this will consistently guaranteed. Who's this other fold? Gentiles. Okay, John 11, next passage. Look at verse 52. You can read this. And not, he's talking, not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one, the children of God who are scattered abroad. There again, outside of Israel. Um, 1 John 2, 2. This is a great passage in the sense of, we'll get into this later. But John is writing, the same John. And he says, he himself, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Is he talking about the propitiation being for every last human being? I don't think so. Some people take that. The Arminian will say this and say, see, Jesus died for every last human being. I think the context is really clear through the rest of John's theology is that it wasn't for us only, the Jews. It's for the whole world, all peoples. And then the last one, Revelation 7, this is John again. He's focusing on what? A great multitude that which no one could count from every nation and all tribes, tongues, peoples, etc., etc. All right? Okay. Secondly, if John 1, Jesus said this, if this is provenient grace in John 1, 9, in the Arminian system, 
then why does Paul teach 20 plus years later that mankind is still inherently natural and universally sinful and unable to seek God? You see that? To me, that I struggle. I say, well, you're going to have to give me something because if pervenient grace came at Jesus, first of all, we have two problems. One is the Old Testament, and secondly is Romans 3, which is roughly 55 AD. He still is describing them universally as being sinful. He, he would say, hey, by the way, that whole sinful thing, it's true, but it has been overcome by this pervenient grace that was given by Jesus at the, when he, at the cross or when he came into the world. You see that? We still have this, now we have this theology that's battling. It's like, well, now who's right? Is Paul right? Because Paul's not making an exception for the, the present depravity of man. Do you see that? That's what I struggle with is Paul is saying, hey, look around, everybody. Universally, theologically, biblically, experientially, we're still bad. Okay. Um, letter C there is another interpretation which most of the scholars like on the Calvinist side say, no, nah, John 3, 9, they, they don't even agree. They, they would say that it could be that John is talking about all peoples, which that's, that's my position. But I think John 3 helps out too because... The light, comparing with John 3, 19, the light that Jesus brings is one of exposure. His light reveals that our deeds are wicked. His very light in existence is a point of contention. When Jesus comes in the world, he's bringing light. Well, in John 1, 9, we later get to understand what that light looks like. In John 3, same author, explaining when Jesus comes in the world, he reveals that men's Love darkness rather than light. I think that's consistent as well. I think this is another example. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Notice the similarity in language. This is judgment. The light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Therefore, this light is not prevenient greats as is suggested by some, but another demonstration of the gap between the pure light of Christ and man's fallenness. Additionally, this doesn't help Old Testament saints. Okay? Number two there, um, Jesus' death, the Arminian says, well, prevenient grace is true because we have John 129. But also Jesus' death on the cross and the providing of atonement for humanity is the instrument of prevenient grace in the world. Unfortunately, there's no direct scripture provided for the assertion. It is inferred. So the fact that Jesus died on the cross, died for everybody, therefore this prevenient grace is given to everybody. No scripture to back that up, unfortunately. Plus, again, we still have the problem of the Old Testament saints. So it, it, it fails there. The third verse, um, John 12, is that they'll use is, and I, if I, Jesus says, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to myself. What is the drawing of all to himself? And who is, remember we saw this last time? That in, in John 12, 32, it says, and we saw last time the word draw and how it kind of, it, not kind of, it means drag. It's very, it's very effective. He will draw slash drag all. And then some of your versions will say people. It might say peoples. Uh, it might say man. That's not in the Greek. All it says is all. So you fill in the gap. I will draw all to myself. Well, is that all meaning through prevenient grace? I think that the context, again, is the Greeks show up. Jesus is, he just got done raising Lazarus from the dead. He's, getting, he's into his Passion Week. The Greeks show up. Philip, we're from Greece. We want to talk to Jesus. We're Gentiles. Yeah, we know, but we want to talk to him. So Philip comes up. He says, hey, the Gentiles over here are Greeks. Jesus ignores the request. And he starts talking about his, him being a seed in the ground, and if it dies, it'll produce much fruit. What fruit is that? All the other sheep that he has from all, I mean, he just got done saying that. And, he's, and so he says, after the Greeks, these Gentiles are trying to come see him. He rejects the request and says, the only way that I'm going to respond to them, if, they, if the Gentiles want to know me, if I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. I, I take this as peoples because it's consistent with all the rest of the Johannine theology. And saying, Greeks, just wait. Wait till my death, and then you'll get your chance. The Gentiles will get their chance after I have died, because my atonement is based and meant for all peoples, including you Greeks. But not yet. You see that? I mean, you might not, but that's... 
Um, again, if Jesus is lifted up from the earth, we still have the Old Testament problem. Um, we, uh, letter C there. Thirdly, I'm moving fast because we're running out of time. We saw that, John 6, 44. You can read that on your own. Um, but let's, Titus 2, 11 is, you can read that as well. And number five, the notes. But what I do, I want to I wanna wrap it up on this last one. So turn to the last page. Because I don't think even the Titus 2.11 is a problem because of the way the language is written. But if we, if we think about how this Corvinian grace works, okay, we have these issues. Um, all right. Uh, I've given you some, some, some passages here, but here's the question. Here's the question. Okay, um, remember this? You guys have all seen this before, right? Mm -hmm. God's over here. Sinful man's over here. Okay? And we need to jump this gap. Uh, good works, religion, everything doesn't make us just going to put here eternal punishment, all right? God's holy. Now, here's, here's what you have. The cross is still the way. For both the Arminian and the Calvinist. Okay? That's, that's the same. But what happens is, is for the Arminian, they get rid of this. And now there's this free will that's been readapted. The I'm going to put here the Calvinist and the Arminian. Okay, here we are. Okay, he's happy and he's sad. Okay, okay. <laughs> What is, but even for the Calvinist, according to the Arminian, he still has the ability, I'm going to put wings on these guys, okay? Those are my wings. Don't, don't be mocking my drawings, okay? <laughs> to get across the gap, God has given all people wings now to get across through proving and grace. You follow? Yeah. What is the deciding, decisive factor between this guy making it over and this guy, maybe, let us get rid of the C and the A. This will be a saved and this will be an unsaved. What is the deciding factor between the saved guy getting over here and the unsaved guy not? No? The, whether they flap their wings or not. Their choice. Yeah. Their choice. The difference, all things are now, remember, equal. The, the deciding factor is their free will. So... But they, it's interesting to me that the Arminian says, oh, no, hold on, we're not making the deciding factor them. God is working. No, I, I, I think you are. Because all things are equal. Therefore, the difference between the saved and the unsaved is based on the person. Therefore, the same guy over here says, well... I'm sorry, Joe, that you chose to reject free will or to reject God's grace, but there must be something in me that gets me over here and not you. It can't be something in God. Why? Because they both agree that God has already equally given them something. You follow? The guy over here is going to say, hey, Joe, God gave you the same thing that he gave to me. God's fair. So the difference between you and me is not God. The difference is something. You see, it just... yeah. Now, here's some verses as we wrap it up. Number one there. It does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Is that not clear? It does not depend on the man who is doing his free will, but it depends on God. Okay, that's, okay let's go to the next one. And what I did here is I gave you the NASB and the NET, which is also really good. It does not depend on Romans 9.16. It does not depend on human desire or exertion, but God. James 1.18. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. By his sovereign plan, the net says, he gave us birth through the message of the truth. 
John 1, 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe, who were born not of blood, which is ancestry. They were born again, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I look at this and I think, I understand what they're trying to do, but if you make everybody equal, the, the believer says, again, the only difference between me and you is me. Because God has been so gracious to all of humanity by giving the Primini grace. Hey, he gave the same thing to you equally as he did to me. Therefore, the distinction is what the, the deciding factor between me and you is my will. But yet we see right here, it does not depend on the will of man of how we got across here. Right. I mean, argue with me here. Play the devil's advocate. The scripture to me is, is, seems overwhelming. So, um, let's just go down to the bottom. Um, I put there partial regeneration. This is problematic. Be born again. There's simply no evidence for a partial new birth. Okay. The last th such paragraph on that page. Consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not. So that he may nullify the things that are. So that no man may boast before God. But by what? Doing his. His doing. You are in Christ Jesus who became to us the wisdom of God. So that it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. An Arminian would say, yes. The reason the person who is over here is because of God's doing and giving them provenient grace. But in reality, they had to make the choice to fly over here. And in reality, I see what they're saying, but the person over here ultimately says, hey everybody, the reason I'm here and they're not is because of sure. me. I just self-righteous. Well, it might even be humble. It's, it doesn't matter. It doesn't it's matter, right? It's humility. Hmm. Who is the one that was well, provided? Maybe they're saying, hey, again, we don't want to, it's just not always self-righteousness. It could be. Hey, I have to recognize that I exercise my free will. That's why I'm here. I wish Joe would too. But he can do it just as much as I can because God has empowered him and enabled him. But in reality, Lord, the reason I'm here is because of me and the final decisive thing using my libertarian or even provenient, gracely enabled will. Our hearts are deceitfully wicked before but there, we're saved. And the, the whole thing is okay. we're saved by grace and it is the obedience of faith of Abraham, who is the lamb and who is the priest? Who applies the atonement? Christ alone. And it's a gift. Right. And, and we have to realize that we have nothing in our hand to bring. God provides that lamb. Yeah, the, uh, the, but there are many who would agree with you. They would say, oh, well, of course, we cannot. We didn't get here on our own. God enabled us. But we just finished. If you're going to say something, then we've got to wrap it up. No. Okay. What the boasting? I just think Romans nine sixteen and others is is not based ultimately on the will of man, and that's what you have in the system. Is they're all empowered and they get over. But we're going to see more of that next week. Uh, we're going to talk about foreknowledge that God looks down potentially the corridors of time and sees man's choice, man's will being exercised, and we're going to talk about Romans nine. So, any final comments? You know, I'm looking over your chart there, uh -huh. and when you realize that it's Methodism and Lutherism and Pentecostalism and Charisma and uh, Charismatics and Baptists, and then you go down to Calvinism and Presbyterian, we're talking hundreds of millions of people. Mm -hmm. Now, are they following false teachers and false religion? Because this is very clear that they're following these doctrines. I mean, I have to admit, I am so over my head in this class, but thank you. Because, you know, I know the Holy Spirit will reveal to me what I'm supposed to know. Sure. Because my mind is absolutely... This is advanced, right? We oh, said that <laughs> from the beginning. Okay. Praise God. But, but so I know that I will, it will be revealed to me what I'm supposed to know. So I'm, I'm backing off like, whoa, I'm, yeah. I'm drowning here. What? But when you look at all these... 
these religions, these denominations, that is scary because there's a lot of innocent people who would not even know these differences that you're allowing us to see. Exactly. And they're loving and they're kind and they think they're saved or they believe they're saved. Are they following a false teacher now or a false well, religion? Are they doomed because of this? Let me wrap it up in what I am not saying. Or yeah. even what... Even what Calvinists, Calvinists, they are not saying, or Reformed theology is not saying that all Arminians are going to hell, they're not saved. Not at all. Okay. This, is a, this is an in-house debate of how we got there. What a Calvinist would say is, yeah, you got there and you're giving yourself credit, but in reality, when you get there, you'll realize okay. you're going to lay your crown and you're going to go, you're going to boast only a Lord. That's why the leaders come under stricter judgment. And Correct. They, it's told us in the Bible that these, these false teachers stand in the gate are preventing people from entering. Because in reality, salvation is through Jesus Christ, through faith alone, and they would all affirm that. So no one's denying their salvation. But we're getting into, these are, again, this is advanced, this is not, okay. we stand before God, hey, were you a Calvinist or Arminian? That's not, <laughs> that's not what's going to be said. Because it's real obvious to all of us when we see the false teachings about uh, sexuality. Sure. If you're okay, come on into the church. We're Correct. Going to embrace you. Different bishops of the Anglican Church and Methodist. They are now embracing truly yeah. evil. Truly. Content. They're, now, I will say this. There's a lot of ramifications for all of this. That extend outward. But this isn't a salvation issue as it relates to that. Well, let's pray, shall we? Father, we do thank you. Short time here uh, that we have. But we thank you for your word that it is... Um, Again, very, very overwhelming in its, in its clarity, I think, and uh, extensive and exhaustive. So it's not like we're just pulling a verse here or a verse there. But help us to be humble, to, to, in my mind, as we, as we think about all of us, how did we get across that gap? And we'll see that more next week. And um, to me, it, it humbles myself in that the reason I'm there is because of you. And, but yet, well, as we talk, I still responded after the fact, after you regenerated and worked in my life. And, uh, and that's a great thing, but even that is a gift from you. So anyways, we thank you, Lord. Help us this week as we, may, may we all read Romans 9 and kind of get a glimpse of it as we think about it next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.